I am very happy to welcome all of you to our lunch discussion and our lunch launch of the study of a feminist foreign policy for the EU. And we have been waiting for this event for a very long time because we actually wanted to launch this study in Brussels with all of you being present in person, but COVID as with many other things messed it all up a bit. So we are very happy that now in this digital sphere, we will be able to launch this study and you will see with me, I'm Hannah Neumann, member of the European Parliament. You will see with me Ernest Urtasun, who is my colleague in the European Parliament, also member of the Green Party in the European Parliament. And you see with me Nina Bernarding and Christina Lunz, who were the two amazing authors of this study, which we are now going to present, and they are from the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. What will we do in the next one hour? Um, I will, me and Ernest, we will give you a short introduction to the topic and why we commissioned this study. And then Nina and Christina will present the results of the study. You will have the opportunity um, to ask questions to all four of us. And to ask questions, please use either the Q&A function of Zoom or the chat. I will be trying to follow the questions you ask and then raise them to the panel as a whole. And then I think Ernest will wrap it all up and give you also a bit of an idea of how we intend to continue things. That's the plan for the next one hour. And I hope you all are able to understand and see us clearly. Why did we do this study and why do we do this event? My very own personal experience from being a peace and conflict study researcher in my previous life before making it to the European Parliament is that peace deals, peace negotiations are the better, the more diverse the people are who get engaged because our societies are diverse and every solution to a conflict, especially in divided societies, needs to take this diversity into account. And science kind of reiterates this by saying that the more women, are at the negotiation table, for example, the longer peace deals last. However, if I look at the situation um, in peace negotiations, but also about how we as the EU spend our money in conflict regions, um, it's mostly men who make the decisions and um, we want to change that. And that's why we started the process. And I think if you look at the EU at the moment, in rhetoric, all this has been realized and all this has been recognized. We have action plans, we have strategies, we have resolutions. We even have a new, nearly gender equal um, commission. But we really need to speed things up. Um, for example, if I look at the EU's um, emissions, the military and the civil emissions, we are having 12 missions. And in 2020, all 12 missions are still headed by men. So although we have all these nice goals in writing, um, if I look at the reality, there's still a very large gap. And that is why Ernest and I, we said, well, we need to use our role in the parliament to exactly help closing this gap. We also decided to do this now because I think now maybe it's the best moment to move ahead for a number of reasons. First of all, we have a female head of commission for the first time ever. And the female head of commission was committed to gender equality. They have, the Commission has announced to come up with a gender action plan, a revised gender action plan for foreign policy in October. And we see on the other side, many EU member states who are working towards a more gender equal or even feminist foreign policy with, of course, Sweden in the lead, but we also see catching up Germany, France, Spain, and many others. So I think there's a momentum, um, a momentum to turn rhetoric into action. And that is why exactly, and we wanted to make sure that the European Parliament and the Greens in the European Parliament are kind of spearheading this, mo this movement. And that is why we um, work on a process in the Parliament, um, but we also wanted to cooperate with those who work on that pro process in activism and in research, which is amongst others, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. And having said that, I would actually like to just hand over to Ernest, who is my co-rapporteur on this file, and who, who will also have some um, introductory remarks. Ernest, just unmute yourself and take over. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you, everybody, for participating in this webinar. I will be very brief. Uh, firstly, I want to thank Nina Bernardine and Christina Lutz for their work. It has been extremely important, the report and the study you have done in order to uh, help us drafting the report in the European Parliament together with, that we have done together with Hannah. 
your ideas, your proposals have been extremely useful and we will have the chance to discuss it today uh, together with you. And I can only say that the report that we intend to uh, pass in the plenary with HANA, and I'm sure that we will be successful on that, it comes at a, at a very timely, uh, in a very timely moment, uh, because we see uh, in, different, uh, uh, in different places of the world uh, an intention to backlash on women's rights, uh, there is uh, attacks on women's rights defenders, and we also know that the development of a, feminine por a feminist foreign policy uh, is um, uh, an, an extremely important tool in order to make the world and the foreign relations something more stable, more secure, more multilateral, and where dialogue is at the center of, uh, of, of the relations between, uh, between nations and be between states and between international organizations. And that is why we wanted to develop that report, uh, building on the experience also that some member states have been developing to really have a feminist foreign policy at EU level, tackling three things that I think are really important. Firstly, to give a priority to gender equality in all EU's foreign and security actions and policies with an external dimension and safeguarding their rights. Secondly, guaranteeing women access and participation in all decision-making levels when it comes to foreign policy. And thirdly, something very important, which is to allocate significant resources to achieve this vision. And also, this uh, uh, report that uh, we are working with, Hannah, comes just before the presentation of the Gender Action Plan number three, which, which tackles those issues at the institutional level, so it comes at a very important moment. So I'm very happy that we have the, that webinar. I'm sure that also uh, the reactions and the debate that will come after the presentation will also help us a lot in developing our work. And uh, I can only say that uh, I'm very happy to host that also with uh, Hannah Neumann. And I would like also to thank her for the extremely good cooperation that we have had on that uh, in the last months. So thank you, Hannah. And the floor is back to you. Thank you. Actually, I think the floor goes to Christina and Nina, but thank you, Ernest. And it was also amazing, I think, also in a, a picture to the outside, because I'm taking care of this in the Foreign Affairs Committee and Ernest in the Gender Equality Committee, which confused quite a lot of people and is also part of this breaking stereotypes thing. So thank you to you as well. And now, without further ado, um, I would like to hand over to Nina and Christina. And the next 10 minutes are yours. Thank you so much, Ernest, Hannah. It's such a pleasure to be here with you um, and to be able to present our study. Um, so Nina really is the lead author of the study. So I will be, oh, wow, here, is, here are our slides. Um, um, one sec. So I will be a bit, um, I will be brief. Nina will present the, um, the, our clear recommendations in a second. Before that, I will be setting the scene, what the, the, the study is about. Um, so the, the study has kind of three core, um, core headings, three core sections. Um, Nina, if you could like move to the next slide, that would be amazing. Um, so, so you have like the introduction bit um, where we talk about the, the purpose, why we're doing this um, study, why the timing is just perfect. Um, and what the limitations of our studies are. Then the second part is kind of the status quo feminist foreign policy. And in that section, we have a look um, at feminist foreign policies around the world. Um, um, more precisely, um, we're looking at Sweden, Canada, France, and Mexico, um, but also what's been happening within the EU over the past couple of years when it comes to gender equality and foreign policy. And the third section, which is really kind of the, the choose of our study, um, that is the, the the proposals for a EU feminist foreign policy. So I'll very briefly um, um, discuss kind of the, the 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 intro bit and the status quo feminist foreign policy um, before Nina does the main part. Um, so um, the timing for feminist foreign policy for the um, EU is just perfect now, and that is because we believe or we see that there are a couple of like in factors that encourage a feminist foreign policy. And on the other hand, there are many factors that kind of demand a feminist foreign policy. So when it comes to the factors that encourage, encourage a feminist foreign policy, that is, first of all, those states that within the EU but, and outside the EU have already adopted a feminist foreign policy. Um, and that is kind of a growing movement. So it started with Sweden and then Canada and then France and Mexico earlier this year, but also Spain and Luxembourg um, and, and Germany um, are more and more prioritizing gender equality within their foreign policy. 
um, Hannah mentioned it before, um, um, von, der, von der Leyen, and, and, but also the EU Commission's new um, strategy on gender equality uh, um, are further encouraging factors why we believe now is the time for a feminist um, foreign policy. And on the other hand, there are more and more developments globally that really demand a kind of a proactive, um, um, proactively demands proactively voicing um, or demanding social justice and um, gender equality within foreign policy. And that is a growing European um, populist movement. It is a rise in authoritarian and political leaders around the world. It is the growing attacks on HTTPQI um, rights and uh, women's rights and human rights in general. Um, so um, if you take all of this together, um, it to, to us becomes obvious that there has barely been a better time to implement a feminist foreign policy on the EU level. Um, so regarding the status quo of feminist foreign policy, I'll be very brief. Um, you can have a look at the study later to get, get like a lovely, I believe, overview of what's been happening in the world over the past couple of years when it comes to feminist foreign policy. So Sweden introduced the feminist foreign policy in 2014, um, and it's by far until now the most comprehensive one. And um, then 2017, Canada um, introduced a feminist approach to their um, international development policy, but by now have extended it to other areas of their foreign and security policy. France last year um, announced a feminist diplomacy, what they call. Um, it, um, it has encouraging signs and they've done encouraging steps, um, but we're yet to see for them to really mainstream it throughout the, the foreign and security policy. Um, and Mexico in just, just now in January 2020 announced a feminist foreign policy and by doing so it's the first country from the global south to do so. So really looking at those countries and um, what they have been doing also informed our work and, and, and the proposals that Nina will present in a second for what we believe is absolutely fundamental for a EU foreign policy. And to, um, to, to make this proposal, um, we used a framework um, that has been development, uh, that has been developed over the past couple of months by the um, by a you know, by a group of um, organizations led by the International Center for Research on Women in, in, in Washington DC, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. We are part of that group as well. So we, all of us, and with like consultations um, with more than hundred um, organizations from all over the world, we came together and really sat down and we're thinking through. So if other countries or international organizations are to propose a feminist foreign policy, what is the framework? Like what does such a proposal need to cover? So we, for the study for Ernest and Hannah, um, it was actually the first time that this framework, the feminist foreign policy framework, um, that it was used for a concrete proposal for a um, feminist foreign policy. Um, so we're, we are very excited and very proud that um, our proposals are based on kind of this uh, feminist foreign policy framework that has been in, um, developed internationally um, by, by many civil society organizations. And this um, framework and to propose a feminist foreign policy, we believe there are certain elements that need to be addressed. And we have done so, Nina will present it in a second. Um, and those elements are the purpose. So think through what, what is the government's or an organization's specific purpose of adopting a feminist foreign policy and how is it linked to domestic policies, for example? Second, the definition, like how does this government or organization um, define feminist foreign policy? Does it only mean gender in foreign policy or is it like really trying to tackle social inequalities on like a broad and intersectional scheme? Third, it's the reach, like what is the scope of the policies? Do we include everything from development and trade and disarmament, or do we only focus on specific areas? Fourth, it's of course the intended outcomes. What does an organization or government want to achieve with their feminist foreign policy? And fifth, it's the plan to operationalize the feminist foreign policy. So in the study we're presenting today, we have covered all those five, um, um, five, um, uh, corrective, five areas. Um, and Nina now, because my two or three minutes, we are way past that, um, will take over now and 
present what we believe is really core um, to a feminist foreign policy for the European Union. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, and as I said, I will try to um, present our findings of a 40 or 50 page study within the next uh, five minutes. So bear with me if I um, might uh, make, uh, make my mate some jumps. Um, can I see the next slide, please? Um, so before I will say um, on the, uh, before I will outline our concrete recommendations, I want to say a couple of uh, sentences on the status quo of feminist foreign policy within the EU external action. Because obviously what we did before we defined recommendations, we looked at the status quo of the European Union and what kind of um, policies and strategies are already in place. Um, and it is important to highlight that within the last years, there have various different EU entities have developed and initiated strategies and policies that aim to a certain extent to, um, at promoting gender equality through and within um, the EU external action. Um, for example, the most prominent example of this is most likely the strategic approach to uh, women, peace and security, which was um, adopted in 2018. Um, however, we do see some challenges and I will only touch upon two very briefly here. Um, what, and they both are linked to the, to the dominant narratives around gender and um, gender equality. Um, and we found, for example, that the dominant narrative around gender within the EU foreign policy policies and strategies is mainly understood as meaning women and specifically white and heterosexual women. So we are lacking an intersectional approach to it. We are lacking an, an understanding of gender that accounts for the needs and perspective of LGBTQI um, people. But most importantly, or not most importantly, but also importantly, we also um, lack the understanding that gender is a way of categorizing power. Um, and this is not um, translated into, into the um, strategies and policies. And secondly, um, and I called it on the slide, e equality for the sake of efficiency. A lot of the approaches that um, favor gender equality or that promote gender equality follow a neoliberal logic and follow an instrumental logic that argue for gender equality because it makes um, security better or more efficient or development um, more efficient um, or economic growth better. And we have, this approach is obviously very problematic because it does not pursue gender equality as a standalone goal. And it also reflects the understanding that peace and security are gender neutral, that you can address through gender blind policies. And when you add gender, these policies only become better, but they don't question the underlying structures or um, analysis or the purpose uh, of these stru uh, structures if you add gender um, in, the, in the end as an add-on, for example. Um, and we've also shown in our study that these two challenges, uh, which we obviously discuss in more in depth in our study, lead to um, many gender blind policies within EU ex external action service, but also to inconsistent policies. And just two examples of um, gender plan policies are is the EU policy on countering terrorism and preventing violent extremism, which has no reference to gender, and also the EU policies on conflict prevention. Um, secondly, these narratives around gender and gender equality also lead to um, a lack in policy coherence, which amongst others allows the EU to really advance the women, peace and security agenda on one hand, but on the other hand also advance the militarization and the defense cooperation um, within the external action service. And in our understanding, that is contradictory and that does not work together. Um, so now moving on to what we actually want the EU or what we think the EU foreign policy should look like. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, and this, as you can see from the heading, is called Reach of an EU Feminist Foreign Policy. So as Christina just outlined the framework, it is already the third step. So it is behind the definition uh, and the purpose. Um, but you can read um, upon this in our study. Um, so we've defined five priority areas that we think would put the EU on track uh, to adopt a feminist foreign policy. Um, the first one is, after what I just said, probably um, um, obvious is to adapt an institutionalized and inclusive and comprehensive definition of gender that accounts for the needs and perspective of uh, gender non-confirming people, um, but also sexual minorities and accepts gender as a system of power. And also 
um, that recognizes that peace and security are highly gendered and that if you apply gender neutral policies, you will most likely do harm by reinforcing existing gender inequalities. Um, secondly, and that is also at the core of our study, is reverse the militarization of the EU external action and prioritize human security. Um, a lot of things fall under this heading. Um, one of them is the end of export of arms manufactured in Europe um, and or by Euro uh, European companies. Um, actively support efforts to international disarmament, arms controls and non-proliferation. Um, strengthen gender sensitive civilian conflict prevention policies and tools. Um, align the EU external action service on security, um, the EU um, work on security with the women, peace and security agenda. Um, um, and raise the EU's ambition and capacities to mitigate the consequences of the climate crisis and pursue climate justice as a guiding principle of the EU external action. And that is linked to our um, call to prioritize human security as we see the climate emergency and its consequences as one of the most biggest threat uh, to human security at the moment. The third priority is actively pursue intersectional gender equality as a guiding principle of EU external action. So for example, um, making sure that all EU external actions promote gender equality as a standalone criteria. Um, ensure that gender sensitive conflict analysis is, is part of this process, but also advance the rights uh, of um, um, gender non-confirming people and sexual minorities, specifically in the area of reproductive rights, um, but also attacking, uh, addressing the violence against women as a, as a priority area. Um, fourth, um, enhance cooperation with and support uh, to feminist civil society. And that is also very important um, because the, um, a feminist foreign policy is always inclusive and accountable to those it impacts. Um, and one of the um, recommendations among uh, this uh, four setting is, for example, to hold a um, European and international wide consultations on feminist foreign policy and how the EU feminist foreign policy approach should look like. Because, um, and it's also stated very clearly in our study in the beginning, um, we have, we have done the best that we could in this very short time period to um, acknowledge and include a lot of perspective from other civil society organizations, but we do want to acknowledge that we have not had the time or the capacities to, for example, uh, consult with feminist uh, for, uh, civil society in um, third countries that are impacted by the EU. So this is why this is one of a very important recommendation for us in the study. And then lastly, it's to show political leadership towards implementing a feminist foreign policy enhance internal and institutional capacities to do so and ensure institutional by gender parity. Um, and again, there are very detailed recommendations under this heading, but I think I will leave it for now here and, and open up the floor for questions. Thank you very much, Nina, and thank you very much, Christina. And um, I think the framework that you just outlined on of which you said you applied it for the first time was very helpful to structure and organize the many layers and aspects that a feminist foreign policy has and should have. And at least for me personally, I think the two, the two key takeaways were the first one that if we speak of feminist foreign policy of gender equality, it's not just men and women. And I think taking this lens of just allowing for the whole diversity that is out there to be represented also takes a bit out this confrontation attitude that we may have seen in recent years where it was always what is the problem with the men or um, well these these um, challenges that we get and I think the second one at least very important for me is that this notion of a feminist foreign policy underlines the necessary shift towards the aspect of human security rather than nation state security or rather than military security or infrastructure security and I think this also makes very clear that the feminist foreign policy is not just for women, but it's there for everybody because it's putting people in the center. Um, I would just like to encourage everybody else to come up with um, questions. Um, I have one question already from Putri Rama Asri from Indonesia. And she says that in many Southeast Asian countries and domestically, there are challenges to gender equality and there is still um, this um, discrimination of um, women and uh, intersexual people. So for her, the question is, are these countries kind of ready for feminist foreign policy? Or should, um, should, would it be necessary to uh, start domestically? Or which, which, which aspect should come first? Or how should the two 
relate to each other. Maybe you can take up this first question and I hope this just encourages everybody else to come up with questions to you as well. Nina, Christina, you just choose um, and go ahead. Thank you for the, for the question. Um, it's obviously a very important point to raise. And, and although we focus on foreign policy, it's obviously always linked to the domestic, le domestic level. So we do not believe that you can have a feminist foreign policy without having a domestic uh, feminist foreign policy. And for example, that is one of the um, great advantages of the Swedish approach is that they label their entire um, government a feminist government. But we've also seen it with the Mexican approach, for example, who also acknowledged that they have challenges as every country um, internally, and that part of their um, approach to feminist foreign policy is also to look internally. Um, so I, I don't think it is we are, we necessarily need to wait um, until everyone has solved all the internal problems until you can adopt a, um, a feminist foreign policy. But I do think that they're interlinked um, and that they're also informed by each other. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe to add to that, um, definitely interlinked um, and. So um, yesterday, for example, um, or today, we're going to have an interview with like an incredible um, activist, um, a feminist, um, African feminist activist. And she was part of a group of um, feminist um, African thinkers that um, demanded a um, rethinking of international cooperation under COVID. Um, so what they're doing, they're focusing lots on um, on, on a domestic policy, but understanding kind of this um, interconnectedness um, and demanding the, on the international fee as well. And very often, I guess, we can see that when, uh, when feminist civil society international, they demand a feminist approach um, to their foreign policy, that voices are being heard saying, yeah, yeah, but first, like, sort out like what's happening at home and kind of distracting them from tapping into like wider and even more exclusive international diplomatic circles and it's also a way of kind of trying to keep them out when in fact this is where they also need to be because the international as Nina just said is so linked to the domestic um, and and then it also has to do with dynamics such as like receiving states and like donor states and taking all those um, dynamics into account and it has to do like with where where weapons being delivered where are conflicts being solved and um, where not and feminist thinking needs to be in all areas of society to like profoundly transform how societies work and how power is distributed in societies around the world because unless we bring feminist thinking and criticizing power dynamics into all areas, we won't see a transformation that in the end really, like genuinely leaves no one behind. Thank you very much. And now the whole Q&A thing is exploding and I'm trying to keep track and I just give questions to everybody individually. So I would like to start with one question that I think would fit perfectly well with Christina, and that is the question with the rise of right-wing populism that we see on, in many EU member states. Um, do you think that this makes it more difficult to push for a feminist foreign policy, or how do you assess the impact? And that question was asked by Jennifer. So maybe Christina, if you could quickly refer to that one. Um. Resistance, of course, always makes it difficult, but resistance also shows the exact need for exactly that. Because um, historically, we've seen that kind of the, the, the feminist movement, intersectional feminist movement, has been the, the strongest force um, standing in the way of right-wing populists and authoritarian leaders. And yet again, like not, not only in Europe, but if you look globally, if it's like the Philippines, Brazil, um, 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 the US or wherever, it's usually an intersectional um, anti-racist feminist movement that is the strongest force against those tendencies. So yes, of course, um, people trying to, to fight the, the, the gender ideology, whatever they call it, makes it more difficult, but it shows the need why we need to organize um, and really kind of step in for a fairer and more just society. Thank you, Christina. And then the next one, I would like to give it to Nina. And, and that is one we have also been struggling with when writing our report for the European Parliament. You said it's important that we have the standalone gender equality goals and the standalone gender equality budget, and we are also calling for gender focal points. At the same time, for a long time, we, we, we have been calling for gender mainstreaming. Um, what is the right balance and which of these two claims are, are more important and why? Um, oh, interesting question. 
Um, I think they're both equally important. So I think it's, as you said, it's important to, to gender mainstream, um, to do gender mainstreaming through all um, policies to, to understand how um, policies impact genders differently and also to understand how policies can contribute to gender equality. Um, but I think it's still important to highlight that we are so far away from gender equality that it needs to be um, its own goal that it, that resources are being put into and attention is being put into. So I don't think they are um, exclusive. I think they are um, um, reinforcing each other. Um, and I think it also highlights the importance to uh, pursue gender equality for the sake of gender equality and not for the sake of making policies better um, or security more efficient or mm -hmm. development uh, more quickly. Um, so I think that's where the logic comes in. Okay, and uh, Ernest, the next one goes to you. Um, there was a question, how is the process continuing, especially I think our parliamentary process and how NGOs can continue to be involved in that one? And as you are the owner of the last steps of this one, I think that question is perfect for you. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. Well, uh, for everybody to know the component in foreign affairs, uh, uh, the document that uh, Hannah produced has already been adopted. Uh, by the way, congratulations, Hannah, because the document is fantastic. Now it goes to the FEM committee when I am the rapporteur. Uh, and, uh, and we uh, are starting negotiations actually tomorrow with the other groups. Uh, we just had the debate today in committee and to, tomorrow we start negotiations. I think it looks good. I think that uh, we, at least in the, at the level of the FEM committee, we have uh, progressive rapporteurs in all the groups. So, so I think um, that we, we will be able to have a, a broad majority behind the text and uh, we will take it to the, um, uh, to the plenary after the summer break, okay? So moments uh, to give us input. You're still on time. I mean, you can always refer to Hannah or myself. Uh, uh, in the FEM committee, we're still finalizing what we call the compromises, which is the different parts that we agree with the different groups. We can introduce new elements if, uh, if needed. So uh, you can always send us contributions. And then even in the, at the plenary stage, uh, there is also an amendment procedure where we could introduce also new ideas. So feel free to send us to Hannah or myself any new idea that, uh, that may come up. We've been, we've, we've been in contact during the whole process with civil society. But the process continues. We're not there yet, so open to receive any further contributions. Thank you, Ernest. And I, I would like also, based on the experience in the Foreign Affairs Committee, take up that one question that asked for building coalitions, because I have to say we were both, I think, Ernest and me, very surprised to see how our first draft, which we found very progressive, came, and and then the other political parties came up with amendments that pushed us even a bit further, including amendments coming from EPP, which is the Conservative Party. So we were very surprised to see that. I think really, as you just said, Christina and Nina, it's the moment to move ahead. And especially in foreign and security policy, I can feel women and even men kind of being frustrated by the slow pace of implementation, which is why now it's really, they are all across the board, across political parties and across member states in the EU willing to push things and I really think this is the moment to capitalize and kind of put in stone some of these words that are out there. So for example in the Foreign Affairs Committee we managed to secure 50% quota for the foreign service of the EU on all management level which even I didn't think we would get the majority for. So this is where we are in terms of coalition building. I have a few more questions so things are really exploding and I like it. Um, I think Maybe the first one goes to Nina because she, she, she did most of the work and the report. And if you could quickly say what a feminist foreign policy would also mean when we discuss trade, when we discuss demilitarization and when we discuss migration. So how would EU policies have to adapt or change in these fields? Um, thank you for the question. So actually there was one of the criticism or the limitations that we highlighted in the study. Um, that obviously uh, EU external action is um, categorized in a way um, that is, to our extent, sometimes artificial and reinforces the, the different um, silos between trade, um, security policy and migration. And we um, specifically said that um, in order to be um, successful, it needs to be a comprehensive approach to, to foreign policy. So it would also need a feminist trade uh, policy. We would also need a total different approach to migration. And for example, the trade um, policy, there is a feminist trade policy by Canada. There's also Sweden is also developing some. So um, 
feminist foreign policy acknowledges that a lot of the inequalities arise from our capitalist system and this needs to be transformed not just within uh, countries but also uh, between for example the global north and the global south so um yes it would it would need to entail migration and trade Thank you very much, Nina. And then Christina, because that one is a bit more of an even funny philosophical kind. It asks, is there this binary between, let's say, a military, militarized male version of foreign policy and that female version looking more for like safety? Um, and can we overcome this binary in, in one way or another? Or do we really have to move down one road or the other? Um. So uh, there is this artificial binary or this categorization in the whole of our, our society, which then has also translated into foreign and security policy, where there's a stereotypical belief that men are the aggressive ones and women are the, the peaceful ones. So we only need to include more women into everything and everything the world will be peaceful. And that is rubbish. Um, so with a feminist approach to like all sorts of thinking in society, we need to overcome this binary because it is just not true. So we are not, we are not arguing for a feminist approach because we believe women per se are more peaceful. So doing something like that would just reinforce sexist stereotyping. But what we do argue is that, um, that if you look at the historical kind of buildup of society and the way that certain groups of society, main, mainly women, have been proactively excluded and limited to the private space. Um, that has created a system where all power and resources over centuries have been in the hands um, of a certain group of men. So that is a fact. That is how society has been developed over centuries. This is the status quo. And now we need to come up with ideas how we kind of disrupt this system and this skewed um, power relations. And to disrupt power relations, what always needs to happen is to take away privileges, unfair privileges, from groups of power, uh, for, from groups of society where power and resources um, have been, um, um, ha have been um, concentrated. So this is what feminist approach to anything, pretty much what this is about. That is a feminist thinking. Um, so that is why we're trying to bring more diverse perspectives into foreign and security policy, not because this group is more peaceful or, or whatever, but just to break up like um, and power monopolies. That is what this is about. Um, um, yeah. And maybe just one sentence to add. It's also sure. part of feminist foreign policy is also to um, highlight and disrupt this gendered discussion and narrative about peace and security. Um, that it is considered as feminine and as weak to call for disarmament, for example, but that it's considered as, as strong and as masculine um, to, to put a lot of money into the development of new arms and, and specifically nuclear arms, for example. So th this is, we're trying to disrupt this, or feminist foreign policy mm -hmm. aims at disrupting this to also highlight that it actually much more, um, it's much more, it's, it's smarter to invest in disarmament than in, um, in new arms. That's actually spot on for one of the next questions that I took from the chat. But before I put that question to Ernest, um, there is the link to the study in the chat. So for all of you who have not yet seen it, we have, there's the link to the study in the chat. So you now, or best maybe just in 20 minutes, um, can already start um, going through it and reading in more depth what Nina and Christina have presented. Ernest? there were two or three times the question that at the moment where we see more EU funding and more EU attention going into defense and going into the development of military equipment and what does that mean for the women peace and security agenda but what does that also mean for our attempt to push the EU more towards a feminist foreign policy? Well, on funding, uh, we when one of the things we advocate in the report is the, that we were uh, earmarked objectives on gender equality very clearly specified. Um, and for you to know, the biggest discussion we are having on budget right now uh, is that we are discussing uh, the so-called NDCI, which is the financial instrument that will uh, define uh, all the external financial instruments of the EU. This is a huge envelope. Uh, we're talking about 80 billion uh, euros that we are now negotiating. The parliament has asked that at least 80% of the funds spent uh, 
uh, take into account the gender component of the program, which is extremely good. Now, of course, we need to negotiate that with, uh, with the council and with the commission. But for us, it's extremely important that we have uh, in all the budgetary tools, not only programs dedicated specifically to gender equality as we have, but that the different programs that we have in our external financial instruments have a great gender component, uh, gender uh, um, analysis behind. And this is what the parliament uh, has asked. We managed to include that in the negotiations and, um, and I'm very happy that, uh, that, that that is the case. Now, when we come to the increase in defense, for instance, the new European Defense Fund, uh, uh, of course, I, I totally agree here with, uh, with Nina, uh, who said that uh, uh, we absolutely need, uh, when talking about the feminist foreign policy, to change priorities and how do we develop our, uh, our security uh, policy. And uh, the, this idea that the feminist foreign policy wants to build foreign defense policy on human security, for me, it, it's crucial. So the, the key thing to understand is that when we mean feminist foreign policy, we do not only mean having more women on board, which is also important, and these are the report calls, but also changing the goals and changing the idea that uh, moving towards a demilitarized uh, foreign policy uh, where human security is uh, at, at the center of it is a permanent and very important component of it. So I would say that um, on funding, we need to cover gender equality. And also when we do uh, our feminist foreign policy, uh, or when we do our foreign policy, we redefine objectives. I think it's both things. Thank you, Ernest. And now that we have spoken so much about the EU, there have been a number of questions going, and I think it would be best if Nina and Christina, you just see who, whom of you picks this one up. The question, how can we go beyond the EU? So first of all, is this like, again, a Western concept, or how is the involvement of actors from the global south and the development of this idea of a feminist foreign policy? And you quickly mentioned it at the, at the beginning, but apparently there is interest to know more. And the second question is, how can we make other countries outside the European Union, and it was explicitly mentioned Turkey, for example, to also move towards a more feminist notion of the foreign policy? So Nina, Christina, you just unmute yourself, whoever wants to pick that one up. Shall I start, start Nina? Like there's so many, so many questions in what you just said, that is really exciting. Um, can I, first I'll take the point about, is this a Western concept? Um, so this is literally a question, an important question. And it's a question that we get asked all the time when we speak about feminism in general, not only feminist foreign policy, like this idea is like, is feminism a Western concept, a white concept? Um, and it goes back to the whole idea about is human rights a Western concept? And surprise, surprise, it's not. Um, it always, um, those who try often to make this point, um, again, are those um, in a country that have the, the, the power to define certain, um, uh, certain ideas. And, but if you look at civil society, feminist civil society around the world, um, feminist ideas are very much um, inherent um, to, to, to think as an activist um, to, to all countries around the world. And that uh, you can find in every country a feminist civil society that is very vocal about their ideas, how they believe society needs to be transformed. Um, and quickly to the question on, um, can we see feminist foreign policy um, approaches in, in other countries? Um, first of all, Mexico is a case in point. Mexico launching its feminist foreign policy in January this year, first global South country to do so. Um, and maybe just a quick other example, um, um, we were just last week contacted by an organization from India, led again by two incredible, um, 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 by two incredible feminists um, with whom we're kind of in, in, in good relationship. Um, and they are now starting a process, uh, they wrote this proposal about developing an Indian feminist foreign policy. So they're doing this work. So um, when, when feminists around the world get organized and inspired, um, we will see more of the, the kind of demands for feminist foreign policy around the world. It, I guess it then depends how much support from other actors they get. Mm -hmm. And we can only say that we as an organization are willing to support all, as many feminist um, civil society organizations around the world um, on that subject matter. That's actually a very encouraging assessment and it also clearly means that if the EU moves towards adopting a feminist foreign policy, one key task would actually be to support other countries 
in doing so and creating like a network of solidarity towards this end. This actually brings me to one question that actually I think Ernest and I and many other of our listeners would be very happy to get some advice on and that is how do we get on board knowing that in EU foreign policy is still very much member states driven and even the EAS depends on the person that it is being sent by the member state. How do we, if we want to work towards an EU feminist foreign policy, get these member states on board that are not particularly um, enthusiastic about that whole gender thing in implementing like a full-fledged um, EU foreign pol feminist foreign policy, if you have any advice on that? Um, I mean, Christina, do jump in, but I think the most obvious response to this is work with civil society and work with civil mm -hmm. society from within um, EU countries, but also from, from without um, EU countries. And I think that also goes back to the question earlier. Of course, countries like Turkey can work towards a feminist foreign policy and the, it would be wonderful if the EU supported these countries, but I think it's more importantly to support feminist actors in these countries um, and not only work um, with governments. Um, but I think in the end, it's also a question of how far are countries like uh, Germany, who say that they prioritize women, peace and security, are willing to um, put the money where their mouth is and to, put, to be willing to put up fights um, about power um, with countries who are opposing this. Um, and th this is a crucial aspect, um, not only in the EU, but also we've seen it in the UN um, and uh, the G7, for example. So, so I think in the end, it also comes down to, to how willing other countries are to defend and advance these, uh, these rights. Yeah, just reiterating pretty much what Nina said. So let me be the the, the femme explainer here. <laughs> I'm like explaining again to Nina what she already said. Um, um, yeah. So studies clearly show that um, the the strongest force um, behind transformation society has been um, feminist civil society. So if you want to get things done anywhere in around the world, um, you need to work with civil society. Um, and build, um, Hannah, what you mentioned before, like those international alliances, international solidarities, that is really key. Um, unfortunately, I guess in, in, in some countries, there's often a kind of hierarchy between government and civil society, and um, some government people do not necessarily perceive civil society on, 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 on par on equal level, and that is a problem. Um, so if we have a, even in how governments, international organizations deal with civil society, if we have a feminist approach there, knowing that we're kind of all equal and there's no hierarchy between um, um, government and civil society, that is already a first step. So pay, um, first of all, pay the, the, the knowledge and expertise of civil society and then get them on board um, and then things will happen, I guess. And moving beyond this notion that people with badges talking to people with badges is all the foreign policy is about. <laughs> so then we're back to the whole diversity issue. Um, maybe one last question to the two of you, and then Ernest has the honorable task to sum it all up. And um, because it came up in the discussion quite often is what can we as citizens or what can we as normal people do to get started either on the feminist foreign policy or to support this push towards the feminist foreign policy? From your own experience, Christina and Nina, working in so many countries and also following how in some countries it was successful and others it wasn't. Um, I think the most important aspect for me is follow your government's um, work and hold them accountable um, and ask questions and, and um, ask questions that challenge the underlining assumptions and, and do, not, do not get disencouraged because someone says, oh, that is, that is naive. Um, or this is this is stupid, but do do hold them accountable. And I think we've seen it last last week, for example, when in the Human Rights Council in Geneva, um, African states introduced a resolution calling for a commission of inquiry on structural racism in in the U.S. And the EU countries, many different EU countries, blocked this and specifically even worked um, pushed on African states mm -hmm. to to re withdraw this um, this resolution. And I think to a certain extent that was mainly possible because civil society did not know that these countries would do this um, because it, it happened in Geneva, it, ha it didn't happen in Berlin, so German civil society did not pay enough attention to, uh, to what, what Berlin did in, in Geneva. So I think that is, that is a crucial aspect, holding, holding the governments accountable. Christina, anything to add? 
Okay, then I think we pretty much try to cover most of the questions. Maybe Christina and Nina, um, we will leave the chat open for a bit because there have been some specific questions like naming the Indian NGO um, that you're working on others so that you could get back to that one maybe directly. Um, so, Ernest, what do we make out of this? Okay, well, thank you so much for the discussion and for the input. Um, well, the first thing that we, I think, uh, all agree on is that uh, there's no such, such thing as a gender neutral foreign policy. This is uh, something that Nina said at the beginning. I think this is the core of the idea that thinking that foreign policy is just gender neutral is, so, is completely bullshit. I mean, foreign policy can be gender blind, but not gender neutral, that's for sure. Uh, secondly, that um, another idea that came during the discussion, I fully agree, in order to fulfill uh, a credible gender uh, feminist foreign policy, you need to have a credible internal agenda when it comes to gender equality. Uh, so it's very important uh, also that when we will push for the EU to have this gender uh, and this feminist foreign policy, that the internal gender equality strategy of the European Union is also credible. And I'm telling that because, um, I mean, it's, uh, if you would have, for instance, uh, all the managerial positions if the EIS is in the, heads, in the hands of, of men, uh, then I, you, you cannot claim yourself as having a, a feminist foreign policy on the outside. If you don't advance in laws internally that change uh, the structures of, uh, of, uh, of inequality, you cannot claim yourself to have a, foreign po a feminist foreign policy. So that coherence for me it's, um, uh, is extremely important. Then I think another component is what, what do we mean by feminist foreign policy? Does that only mean putting women on top of the managerial positions? And this is something that Christina pointed out as well. Well, of course, we want more women in managerial positions. That's, that, 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 that's out of question. We are tired of having only men uh, seated around the negotiating tables when it comes to foreign policy. But it's not only that. It's about changing uh, uh, the, uh, the concepts and the nature of the kind of foreign policy that we do. At the end of the day, I would maybe sum up by saying that we want to move away from patriarchy in, femi in, in foreign policy. And that, uh, that is something that we, it involves more women in managerial positions, but also a change of mind of the men who take care as well of, those, of all those instruments. So that for me, that is also uh, uh, extremely important. Then the issue uh, that was also mentioned during the discussion, that the feminist foreign policy means that it needs to be coherent with different aspects of the external instruments. So that means migration, then that means trade, and trade is an important component of that. We now recently have, uh, for the first time, a new trade agreement signed by the EU with Chile, which has a gender uh, chapter. But it was the first time we never had that. So I think that in order to have a credible feminist foreign policy, we need to be coherent as well with the rest of the policies that we develop. Otherwise, that, that, that doesn't work. And finally, another a strong idea that came up to the discussion, I think, as well, a feminist foreign policy is a, is a democratic foreign policy and for, uh, to have a democratic foreign policy that means a foreign policy that listens to civil society. I think that that, that is also one of the uh, uh, important issues that we, that we also discussed today and then I think that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that we keep in mind and that we, sh we, we should keep in mind. And finally, maybe I will end with this idea which for me is very strong. We have uh, a gender equality backlash in many parts of the world. Uh, the strongest movement in combating the rising of far right in Europe and in the world has been feminism and the fight for, uh, for equality. It, it has been. So the, bigger, the, the strongest wall that we have against the rise of far right populism in the world right now is the fight for gender equality and the feminist movement. This is very clearly uh, in, in many member states. And that's why I think if we want to build, uh, to stop uh, uh, this, uh, these forces to be successful in some parts of the world, we absolutely need to develop uh, our foreign policies with the feminist view and uh, supporting uh, uh, women's rights movements that are, uh, that are working in many, in many of those countries. So, yes, all of this, all of these ideas that we, we have been sharing and developing, we are trying to make the plenary of the European Parliament to adopt those. And, uh, well, I'm pretty confident that we will manage to do that. Uh, and if that happens, of course, it will be thanks to the contributions of many in you, and particularly of Christina and Nina. Uh, and as I said in one, of the, uh, in one of the answers to one of your questions, 
don't hesitate to send us further comments and contributions. We are still middle way to uh, do everything we need to do. So we still have time until uh, on, uh, until after so uh, summer break uh, because uh, the, the vote in the plenary will not happen before that. So we are absolutely open and and me to continue receiving your comments. And thank you so much, everybody, for participating and for your questions. And thanks again, Nina and Christina, for being today with us. Thank you. Can I? Thank you so much. One last comment, mm -hmm. Hannah, is that okay? Sure, go ahead, Christine. Because um, um, Anna's also just mentioned that people can still chime in to what you're doing. Um, it's the same for our study. So this study would not have been possible without the incredible research of um, academics and civil society um, that have been experts on the issues that like we try to bring together for so many decades. So we've been, we build our work, uh, like we're standing on the shoulders of so many giants by like producing this report. And this report now is kind of an idea towards what a comprehensive feminist foreign policy for the EU could look like. But we can't wait for this report kind of to be dissected and like, um, like criticized and, um, and, and for new insights, because that is by no means perfect. That is a starting point. And now we need others, activists in critical civil society to read it and say, well, that's rubbish. We really need to be better at this and develop an even better um, proposal. So this is how the process goes. Yeah, you just said what I wanted to say. Um, we really aim at starting a discussion with this um, um, report and we're really grateful for Hannah and Ernest for the opportunity, but we are inviting um, criticism and views on everything. So please do reach out. I think what you just said sums up your work, but also the idea of a feminist foreign policy working together and reaching each other to get the best out of it rather than just knowing it everything from the beginning and pushing it through. Um, so thank you all of you for having this one hour with us. We are all looking forward towards more engaged discussion on Twitter where Nina, Christina and the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, Ernest and me are, where you can also find the link to this study as well as some comments of this discussion already. We are also all on Instagram. You can reach us through email. We will all four of us, I'm sure, continue to work on this for a few more years because we're just getting started to walk down this path. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon and let's continue um, with that work. Bye. Thank you.